The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good evening, and welcome to another edition of Question Lab. I am your host, Jeff Downing, and tonight we are going to be presenting a set of questions connected to the respiratory system. I don't have my uh, my special slide on there, but that is uh, uh, tonight's subject. We are really happy that you are all here to uh, join in with this uh, for this prep session and uh, to accompany me on this journey tonight is none other than Sean Nanji. Sean, would you like to introduce yourself to the crowd? Absolutely, Jesse. Have you already pulled up your uh, slide here, on the, your PowerPoint on the, on the Oh, screen? you know what? Let me see if I have, I am not sharing yet. Yeah. Well, while he does that, everyone, my name is Sean. I've been with the uh, <coughs> RX coach and uh, US Assembly RX for uh, a little over three years now, working with students like you and our coaches to help you on your academic journey. Looking forward to talking about some respiratory and pulmonology tonight, and uh, hope you guys are ready as well. Okay, thank you, Sean. I've also got Kate here. Um, she is going to be helping answer questions through the question box. So if you have questions, comments, suggestions, anything that comes up tonight, feel free to let us know there in the question box. Um, but with that, what I want to do is, oh, there's my, there is our subject for tonight. I'm going to learn a little bit about you. So we're going to launch our first poll of the evening. The question is pretty straightforward. Who are you? Let us know, uh, M1, M2, M3, M4, are you an IMG or an FMG? Let us know. This is the mechanism we use in order to uh, record your responses. So once you get the hang of this, this is uh, pretty much um, all of the technical know-how you're going to need in order to participate tonight. We're going to have a set of questions for you. We will have a raffle at the end of the evening. One lucky attendee will receive a subscription to RX360+. Plus. Everyone else will have the opportunity to get a special discount off of Yosemite RX products. So make sure you hang around, and uh, we've got some uh, fun things to uh, to talk about here tonight. So. Okay, with that, I'm going to close the poll, and let's see who we've got with us. So it looks like we've got a strong showing from the uh, the, the international crowd, and uh, I've also got a um, good set of M2s and M3s and some M4s here. Uh, no M1s tonight. That's kind of surprising, but um, maybe they're uh, just... Uh, uh, putting this off a little bit longer before they, uh, they they start thinking about step one. That's uh, that's quite all right. Well, let's go ahead and hide the results and uh, get ready for tonight's session. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, walk you through a set of questions related to the respiratory system. Um, and you're going to see that we take it um, through a methodology that we've developed at RX Coach. Um, so at RX Coach, we you know it's a tutoring service that we've um, we established uh, you know, over three years ago. Uh, we've helped hundreds of students uh, prepare for Step One and Step Two CK. Um, and part of what we want to do is we want you to have a method for attacking uh, the questions on test day. Um, so. Uh, as we as we go through these items, um, just know that these are uh, you know some of the 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 tried and true strategies that, uh, that 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 we help teach and reinforce with our students. So with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, start with question number one. Now, if you are new here tonight, if this is your first question lab, we're glad you're here. Um, you're going to notice something a little bit odd when I. Uh, reveal question number one, and that is there are no answer choices, and that's by design, okay? What we do is we say you need to, uh, you're, you're, you're best off by hiding the answer choices, covering them up, because, you know, invariably you're going to run across some, uh, you know, some 
uh, distractors that are really distracting, right? Because you've, you, you, and maybe it's a, maybe it's a drug you don't know anything about. Maybe it's a, uh, you know, a condition uh, that you've forgotten. Maybe it's a hormone that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're mixed up about. So we don't, we don't want you to, you know, to, you know, get frazzled when you're attacking a question. We want you to be very methodical. So we say cover up those, those answer choices. And then step two, we want you to read the lead-in. And the lead-in within a you know USMLE question, and mostly sports style questions, uh, is the actual question itself. So in this case, the lead-in is which set of arterial blood gas values presented in the table is most likely in this patient. Okay. So a couple of things here. We know we're going to uh, we're going to be seeing some uh, blood gas values. Uh, and we're going to need to figure out what, uh, um, you know, what's most likely within that patient. Okay. So again, uh, reading that lead in first, uh, helps you cue, uh, and, and home in on the, 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 the information that you're going to need to know in order to answer it. So from there, then we say, read the vignette. A 55 year old woman comes to the clinic because of 24 hours of palpitations shortness of breath, and chest pain on inspiration. Five days ago, she underwent mastectomy of the right breast due to ductal adenocarcinoma. Pulse is 112, respirations are 33, blood pressure is 110 over 77, and oxygen saturation is 90% on room air. An ECG shows sinus tachycardia. An X-ray of the chest is normal. So again, which set of arterial blood gas values presented in the table is most likely in this patient? So we're going to uh, reveal that here in a minute. Uh, let us know in the question box how many steps you think it will take to answer this question. Is this a one-step question, two-step, three-step? Let us know as I pass it on to Sean. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. We're going to go ahead and show you what we believe are the most important clues in the leading in vignette here. So as we know, we're looking for uh, uh, certain clues here. So we've got a 55-year-old 54, uh, woman. Uh, she's got 24 hours of palpitation, shortness of breath, chest pain on inspiration. Five days ago, mastectomy, right breast, uh, got breast cancer, pulse is 112, respiration is 33, oxygen saturation 90%, and she's got sinus tachycardia, and x-ray is normal. We're looking for ABG values to see what's most likely in this patient. So we're trying to see what's going on. So in order for us to figure out what the ABG is going to look like, you know, our first step is going to be to figure out what the condition is and then which profile matches that uh, 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 condition. So, you know, whenever you, uh, you know, we're going to go ahead and uncover these answer choices for you here. But if you take a look, you know, whenever you see a, a, a table like this, you know, you can start eliminating certain answer choices. So fig figure out which call I'm most comfortable with and mark out the ones that don't fit. And this way, if you keep doing that, at least, you know, you'll be able to uh, have, have a nice thought process. And if you're confused or if you're, you know, trying to eliminate answer because you're not sure what the right one is, it'll still help you. Uh, you know, some, some of those test taking skills will still help you get to that right answer uh, uh, either way. So. Uh, we'll, you know, open up uh, uh, that poll here a little bit. I want all of you to take a moment here to look at uh, that chart. Now, normally when we look at answer choices, you know, we start at the bottom and work our way up, right? And the reason we do that is because we don't want you to, you know, prematurely pick an answer choice or accidentally skip one that you because you, you think you found the right answer. Uh, in this case, you know, the answers are just E, D, C, B, A. So, you know, it's not, not, not the best way to show you, but we will next time. Uh, but anyways, we're going to go ahead and open up that poll and uh, give you all a moment to lock in your answers. Okay, and we're, we're going to launch it. When we launch the poll, where you're not going to see the table anymore. Okay, so um, give you a few more seconds here. If you don't know it, that's okay. Just uh, you know, find what you think is most likely um, for this particular uh, patient, based on uh, all of those uh, those earlier uh, exam results. And we'll go ahead and open it right now. Okay, so the poll is open. Go ahead and let us know. 
which answer you think it is. Um, we're going to keep this open. We typically wait until about two thirds of you have um, have voted. We do encourage you to uh, answer every question on test day. You're not going to get penalized for wrong answers, so you don't want to leave uh, any answer items blank. Okay, let's see. How are we doing? Oh, you guys are uh, doing a nice job in uh, getting your answers in pretty quickly. Almost two-thirds or almost three-quarters of you have voted, so I'll give you a few, few more seconds, and then we will go ahead and close the poll. Okay, we're going to shut her down and share the results. Okay, so uh, mo the the uh, answer choice E was the one that uh, gathered the most votes, while all of the other answer choices is a little bit mixed. So there's something about answer choice E that uh, that jumped out for um, uh, for many of you. Maybe it was the pH level. I don't know. Maybe it was the uh, uh, the carbon dioxide. We'll see here. So let's go ahead and hide the results and share the answer. And the answer is answer choice E. Nice work. Nice work, everybody. This is uh, uh, a good, uh, uh, challenging question to uh, start off the evening. And you guys did well. If you didn't get it right, that's okay. This is the time uh, to, uh, to, to miss the questions. You don't want to miss them on test day. Uh, so what we're going to do right now is Sean is going to walk you through it uh, and help you break it down. Sean? Well, thank you very much, Jeff. So uh, for those of you who have been with us since we started Question Lab years ago, this is actually our third time doing this question. And the reason why we always do it, we're well, not always, but you know, we, we, we do it every now and then is because this is a great example of a physio question that you're likely to see. And it generally gives uh, students a hard time. As you saw today, only 36% of, uh, of, of the attendants got it right, whereas normally, you know, about 43% in our question uh, 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 bank itself get right. So it, it, it is one of our more challenging questions. So let's take a look and see what's happening. So I'm sure that based on, you know, the, the, the signs and symptoms, most people were able to, to realize that this was a pulmonary embolism, right? That, that wasn't the difficult part of this question. But if you didn't get that, you know, th that's, that's what's going on here. You can tell because you've got that pleuritic chest pain, you've got tachycardia, you've got tachypnea, and you've got hypoxia because you see that oxygen saturation is at 90%, right? And, you know, it, and it happened in the setting of a surgery or a malignancy and immobility. And so whenever things like that happen, you're going to have a PE. So, you know, a lot of people usually get that part right. But then what happens is they forget the profile of what happens once they get to the diagnosis. And what's happening in a PE is going to be acute respiratory alkalosis, okay? So once again, whenever you think about a PE, I want you to think about acute respiratory alkalosis, okay? So this uh, presentation was, you know, five days after surgery, right? Had a sudden onset of uh, hypoxemia, tachypnea, chest pain, uh, and you saw the x-ray didn't show any abnormalities, and the ECG, you know, the cerebral sinus rhythm, but, you know, she's got multiple risk factors here, right? She's got, she's got a cancer, and she's in a, a post-operative state, and, you know, we're, we're, and, you know, we're, we're, we're told here that, um, you know, she's uh, 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 got all the right signs and symptoms here to, to lead us towards that uh, thing, and they didn't mention her being on any anticoagulants, right? So if they, if they had said that, 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 could, that could kind of change the equation here and you'd be thinking about something else, but that's not going on here. So when you have acute respiratory alkalosis uh, and you have hypoxemia, you're going to have decreased uh, PO2, all right? You're going to have decreased PO2. So once you know that you're going to have decreased PO2, that's going to uh, help you eliminate, uh, 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 you know, uh, hopefully some answer choices here and, uh, 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 and, and kind of, uh, guide you towards the right answer. So we know that we've got that decreased PO2 uh, and hypocapnia that's due to tachypnea. Now, what also happens in acute respiratory alkalosis is your serum bicarb will decrease a little bit because you don't have enough time for that renal, uh, renal compensation, which can happen over uh, several hours or days. So once you see that profile, right, so you're looking for low partial pressure of oxygen and decreased serum bicarb. 
you've really only got two choices there that can kind of fit that profile, but one of them doesn't have that low serum bicarbonate. Only answer choice three will get you there. So we're looking for an alkalotic pH, uh, right? A, a low PO2 and a low serum bicarb. Okay. So that's the profile for uh, uh, what happens uh, after a PE here. Why are some of the um, uh, other answer choices incorrect? So, you know, if you're going to have, uh, let's go to answer choice D. So in D, you've got a increased pH, okay, uh, decreased PCO2, and an increased bicarb, and that's going to suggest chronic respiratory alkalosis. And that's normally going to happen in people that are living at high altitudes for, for uh, 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 sorry, sorry, that, that the increased pH, uh, that increased bicarb, and decreased POC, uh, PCO2, I, ju I jumped ahead there. So let me just restart here. Increased pH, increased bicarb, and increased PCO2 is going to suggest metabolic alkalosis. Uh, and that's usually going to happen if somebody that's vomiting or is taking a diuretic. Okay, so that's why answer choice D is out. So once again, increased pH, bicarb, and PCO2. All three of those are up. When you see that, that's met, usually metabolic alkalosis. And that's going to be somebody who's vomiting or taking a diuretic. And they like to ask that question sometimes about uh, with patients who've been, you know, uh, kind of having eating disorders or throwing up after they're eating, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, answer choice C. And C, you've got uh, uh, increased pH. You've got the decreased PCO2 and decreased bicarb. And that's, that's right there, the profile of chronic respiratory alkalosis. And that profile for C is usually going to happen in people who are living at high altitudes for longer periods of time, okay? Uh, answer choice B, so we've got in B, we've got a decreased pH, increased PCO2, and increased bicarb, and that's respiratory acidosis, sorry. So that doesn't fit, and you see respiratory acidosis in hypoventilation and in patients who've got like COPD, uh, and, and that's not what we're looking at here either, okay? Answer choice A, so here we've got all three things decreased. We've got decreased pH, decreased bicarb, decreased PCO2, and you're going to see that in metabolic acidosis, and you'll see that when, you know, somebody has diarrhea or uremia, uh, and, and once again, that's not what's happening here. So, uh, you know, the key to getting this question right is, is first figuring out the, 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 that they have a PE, and then figuring out the timeline of that PE realizing that we don't have the renal compensation yet, and then realizing that as a result of that, we're going to have um, acute respiratory alkalosis. And when you have respiratory alkalosis, you're going to have a decreased PO2, um, decreased bicarb, and of course, we know what the pH is going to look like, okay? So uh, there we are here with uh, the nice little chart from first aid. Uh, but uh, you know, great job, everyone. That was definitely a challenging question. Uh, let's move on now to question number two. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Sean. And again, yeah, that is uh, that that that's a good high yield example uh, and the kind of thing that you're going to need to know on test day. So, um, excellent. We're off to a good start. Let's go ahead and take a look at question number two. So you guys know the drill now, and we're going to start off by covering up the answer choices and reading the lead in. So, which of the following stimuli is most likely controlling this patient's drive to breathe. Okay, look at that question. Think about what kind of information you're gonna be looking for as we read the vignette, which we will do right now. A 65-year-old man with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease comes to the physician because of a two-day history of coughing and worsening shortness of breath. He was diagnosed with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease 10 years ago and has had multiple episodes in the past with similar symptoms. Temperature is 37.7 and respirations are 33. Physical examination reveals that he must lean forward and support himself with his arms to breathe. Retractions can be seen with each breath and expiratory wheezes are heard. So again, which of the following stimuli is most likely controlling this patient's drive to breathe? Let us know how many steps you think that this answer is, or this question is going to take in order to answer as I pass it over to Sean.
Well, thank you very much, Jeff. Let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, important uh, clues in the vignette and lead in here. Sorry about earlier, I was, I was on mute. Um, so once again, you know, demographic information, we've got a 65 uh, uh, year old male, we've got COPD, two days of coughing and worsening shortness of breath. He had COPD diagnosed 10 years ago, multiple episodes in the past. As you can see, temperature is 99.8, respirations are 33. Uh, and then he must lean forward to support himself with his arms to breathe and retractions can be seen with each breath and expiratory wheezes are heard. So which of the following stimuli is most likely controlling this patient's drive to breathe? So what's causing that to happen? So uh, let's, uh, you know, take a look at those answer choices, starting at E and working our way up. E, low arterial partial pressure of oxygen. D, low arterial pH. C, low alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. B, high arterial pressure, uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And A, high alveolar pr partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So, you know, once again, another uh, a challenging uh, respiratory physio question. Uh, you know, do your best here uh, uh, and don't worry, we'll, we'll talk about it and get to the right answer afterwards. So we'll give you a few minutes here to, a uh, few moments here to lock in your answers. Okay, here we go. We're gonna launch the poll. And again, let us know which of the following stimuli you think is most likely controlling this patient's drive to breathe. Poll is now live. And as usual, we'll give you uh, maybe about a minute here to place your place your bet, right? Uh, let's see. Just a reminder, we're gonna we will be having a raffle here a little bit later in the evening. You do need to be here. You need to be present in order to win. Okay, it looks like about half of you have voted, so let's uh, go ahead, everyone. If you don't know it, that's okay. Just take your take your best shot. And as usual, we're going to put some uh, some helpful resources in the chat, including uh, a link to uh, our RX study planner, our free study schedule that you can use for step one and for step two CK. Uh, let's see. So about 80% of you have voted. So let's close the poll and see what you guys are thinking. So it looks like we've, you know, there's a uh, kind of a two horse race here between answer choice B, high arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide. In answer choice E, low arterial partial pressure of oxygen. Okay, so looks like the, uh, the you know a little bit of a split in thinking, but again, uh, answer choices A and, B and C both got uh, double digit responses too. So with that, let's hide those results and reveal the answer. And the answer choice is answer choice E. So the second place vote getter. Uh, is the correct answer, low arterial partial pressure of oxygen. So if you didn't get that right, that's okay. Sean is here to save the day. He's going to help, help uh, break this one down for us. Sean? Well, well, thank you very much, Jeff. So, you know, before we get into the explanation, you know, what we've done tonight is we've picked out three of the toughest pulmonary questions we've done in the past two labs, right? And uh, these are topics that generally give students a little bit of trouble. And as you can see here, you know, this is a tough question. Also, you know, 28% of students got it right tonight, right? So th that's definitely a challenging question. And so, you know, one of the things we're going to show you at the end of this webinar or is, 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 you know, students often ask, you know, where can I go to get this broken down for me? Where can I get a simple explanation to learn this topic without having to flip through a bunch of stuff? Uh, and we're going to walk you through uh, one of our bricks at the end to show you, you know, how you can learn these concepts in, in an easy to digest manner. So before we get to that, let me kind of break this question down. But don't worry, we're going to explain this one and then show you how to uh, show you where to go to learn uh, these topics in more detail a little bit later. So, you know, when you have COPD, right, uh, and we, we know they've got COPD and it's gotten worse, right, uh, and, and you're seeing that, you know, he's got a medical history, he's got, you know, similar symptoms in the past, he's got 
tachypnea. He's having to work harder to breathe. Doesn't have a fever. So the fact he doesn't have a fever, you know, lets us know that he likely does not have pneumonia. Uh, and, you know, whenever you see you know, COPD and you see an exacerbation, that's usually characterized by uh, worsening shortness of breath, cough, uh, more sputum, or a change in the character of that sputum. Um, so that, that's step one, figure out what's going on, which we already know. So now that we know that, you know, that COPD is it's just getting worse, it's an exacerbation of that COPD, uh, we got to figure out what's causing that increased respiratory rate. And what's causing it in COPD exacerbations is going to be a low arterial partial pressure of oxygen. So what happens is you have a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide. That's normally the main driving force for respiration. So in most patients, you've got this high partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and that's what makes you want to breathe and breathe. But when patients have chronic hypercapnia, and these, that will happen in patients with COPD, that respiratory drive is instead controlled by the partial pressure of oxygen because that respiratory center over time develops a tolerance to that high partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And so respiratory drive is also influenced in this case by low pH and stimuli such as pain or fever. However, those, those aren't the main controls of respiration generally, okay? So what you have to keep in mind in order to get this question right is that in patients with COPD, it's going to be a case of chronic hypercapnia, and that is going to you know, uh, 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 cause that respiratory drive being controlled by the partial pressure of oxygen, because once again, the respiratory center has developed a tolerance to high partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which in normal patients would cause that drive. Uh, but this patient, unfortunately, has developed that tolerance. So once again, uh, uh, you know, tough question. Uh, let's, let's talk about why the other answer questions are incorrect. So uh, low arterial pH, that is not the main controller of respiratory drive generally in any case. Uh, so so that, that's just you know, one of those uh, red herrings there. Um, C, low alveolar uh, uh, partial pressure of oxygen along with high alveolar pressure of carbon dioxide usually do not influence your respiratory drive. Um, and you know, like we talked about here, you know, uh, um, especially in patients with COPD, it's because they've developed that tolerance uh, uh, to certain things as well, right? Uh, high arterial partial pressure of, of carbon dioxide is typically the main controller of respiratory drive, but not in patients with COPD. So what you see here, you know, is is a good uh, example of how a lot of things sound the same and look the same when you do, when you have these physio questions. So you, you and, and and oftentimes, you know, that that's okay, but when you couple, you know, things that sound the same and, and kind of look the same, along with the anxiety of you sitting in front of a computer taking an important test, it can throw students off their A game really quickly. So uh, some advice I have for you with these things is, you know, respiratory physio is a tough topic, right? Physio in general is. So when you're studying topics like this, when you're answering questions like this, you know, try to see if you can explain the answer to yourself or to a colleague and explain why it's right, why everything else is wrong. Because if you can explain it to yourself, that means you understand it. And when it comes to physiology, it's all about applying what you understand. So if you, especially when it comes to physio, the, the best barometer to make sure you've learned the material is to see if you can explain that to yourself or to somebody else. And if you can do that, especially with physio, that means you understand it, you'll learn it, you'll understand it, you'll be able to apply it, and you'll get these questions right. Let's move on to our last question of the evening before we show you a little something special. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. Just uh, you know, a quick note, we've had a few uh, folks asking about our RX Coach tutoring service. You know, we, um, uh, we launched RX Coach uh, you know, back in 2019, we've been helping students uh, achieve their dreams. Right? We we want to help them uh, reach the level that 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 they're seeking, uh, and that may be, hey, I'm I you know I, I need help getting through this block. I need help uh, preparing for you know CBSSE. Right? I need uh, to you know to 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 pass step one. I need to score high on step two. Um, we understand, uh, you know, we've we've been helping uh, med students, you know, since you know first aid first came out, what 33 years ago, um, 
you know, so what we've done is we've channeled a lot of our experience, a lot of our expertise in helping students succeed. Um, and we do it through a, you know, a one-on-one tutoring program. Uh, and we started off with a, you know, 160 question assessment. You know, we talk a little bit about our, you know, our methodology, but we always want to make sure that it is, um, you know, that, that, that your plan is your plan, right? That, you know, you have your own, uh, you know, sets of uh, strengths and uh, in, in areas of challenge. And we want to make sure that we're, um, you know, that, you know that that we're tuned into that, and that's really what our our, our assessment does. It, it it helps us, you know, identify where, uh, you know, you may need to you know to to emphasize your studies, where you may need uh, some extra remediation. Uh, and again, this isn't you know the, the this isn't a, you know a group setting. This isn't a class setting. You know, you will be paired up with a an uh, highly trained ARC certified tutor, um, you know, and one who is you know really uh, you know, focused on your progress and your success. And, and, you know, one of the nice things is that, you know, you'll also get, uh, you know, free access to, uh, RX 360 plus and all of our study tools. So, um, if, you know, you're interested, if you want to learn more, uh, we invite you to go to, uh, rxcoach.com. So it's rx-coach.com. We've got the, uh, the link in the chat. And what you can do is just, you know, uh, find a, uh, a day and time that works for you um, and set up that consult, learn more about our program. And if you find that, that you know, that this uh, suits your needs, uh, then we will, we'll pair you up with one of our, uh, our experienced tutors and help set you up for success. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, go ahead and uh, launch our third question. And tonight we're, um, we're doing three questions. So this will be our final question of the night. Again, we do have the raffle coming up, um, but we're, uh, we're also going to go a little bit deeper, um, with this particular one. Okay. So let's once again, uh, kind of lay it out for you. And in this case, uh, you can see, uh, you've got a, you know, a chart, and we'll start again with that lead-in. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, so again, this is uh, you know a, a classic uh, step one question, right? So with that, let's go ahead and read the vignette. A 67-year-old man comes to the local community healthcare clinic and reports shortness of breath after even brief exertion and a chronic non-productive cough. He is a retired construction worker and has a 40-pack-year 40 40 year history of cigarette smoking. He is allergic to penicillin. A chest x-ray reveals scattered calcifications in the peripheral lymph nodes of the upper lobes. The pulmonary function test result is shown in the image. So again, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? You can head down into the question box. Let us know how many steps you think this one's going to take. Uh, we've already kind of talked about that, but uh, uh, let us know. And as we do that, I'm going to pass it over to Sean to walk us through this one. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. So once again, we're going to show you what we believe are the important clues in the vignette and lead in. As you can see here, we've got some highlights for you. And, and, you know, we always recommend you, you highlight certain things because a lot of people are visual. It helps you kind of keep those clues in mind. And, you know, as you're reading these answer choices, sometimes you want to look for a clue. And at least you can find it right away. Uh, you know, a lot of people uh, don't highlight. Some people do. We prefer to do it and we recommend you do, but you don't have to, right? Uh, so we've got a 67-year-old male, uh, shortness of breath after even brief exertion, chronic nonproductive cough, construction worker, 40-pack year, allergic to penicillin, Scattered calcifications in the peripheral lymph nodes of the upper lobes. And we have a nice little PFT graph here. And you see volume on the x-axis, time on the y-axis with the patient and productive. So now we need to figure out what this patient's most likely diagnosis is. And remember this, anytime they tell you what the person's job is, 
or was. That's a very, very important clue. Okay, so keep that in mind. So look at that construction worker career, all right? And hopefully that, along with some of the other clues, will help you get to the right answer. Let's take a look at those answer choices. E, silicosis. D, coal workers, pneumoconiosis. C, COPD. B, berliosis. And A, asbestosis. So once again, we're going to give all of you a few moments here to lock in your answer choices. And you're definitely going to have a question about one of these topics on your test. You, you can bet on it. So uh, pay attention here as, when we do the explanation. Excellent. Thank you, Sean. Yes, this is, uh, again, uh, focusing on the highest of high yield, right? These are the questions that you're, um, the, the types of questions you're going to see on test day. So understanding what your approach is. How do you approach this kind of question? How do you parse all of that data and uh, land on a diagnosis? Clinical reasoning 101, right? Okay, so let's see. Uh, you guys are doing well tonight. Yeah, you know, um, uh, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. Uh, I don't know. Well, kind of maybe it depends on the subject, depends on the crowd, but uh, you guys are doing a nice job and uh, getting your votes in. So three fourths of you have uh, voted. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. And we're going to take a look at the results. Interesting one here. So, uh, again, more of a two-horse race. Asbestosis was uh, the, uh, uh, the top vote-getter, but silicosis also uh, brought in almost a third of the, uh, the votes tonight. COPD uh, also got uh, uh, a number of hits. So, with that, let's go ahead and hide the results. And we will share the answer. And the answer is answer choice E, silicosis. So again, the uh, the, the runner-up in terms of votes turns out to be the correct answer. Uh, again, good. Uh, uh, again, a very important kind of question. Uh, the type of question you're going to need to be able to uh, to answer on test day. If you didn't get this one right, that's okay. What we're going to do is we're going to step you through that answer. And Sean's going to do that right now. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, once again, a, a tough question here. And, you know, we have to figure out, you know, what, what this patient has and then what we're going to, you know, what we see as a result of it, right? So, you know, we've got worsening dyspnea, uh, chronic nonproductive cough, uh, and we've, we've got some kind of chronic lung disease. And if you look at that pulmonary function test, you see that you've got, it's demonstrating to you reduced lung volumes, right? And on top of that, you've got these calcifications, right? And they describe them as scattered calcifications in the peripheral lymph nodes of the upper lobes. Now, had they given you a description of it and said eggshell calcifications, I'm willing to bet that a lot more of you would have gotten that question right. So eggshell calcifications, or the way they describe it here, is what you typically see in a patient who's got silicosis, right? So what happens is, you know, you see silicosis, which is a chronic lung disease, and that happens due to inhalation of silica dust. And you'll have that, and there's a couple things that can cause it, right? So, so smoking is one, and this, this person is a smoker, as well as occupational exposure to substances like Silica, which will be in you know, raw glass sand, will all cause you to have an increased risk of having silicosis. And in construction, you're going to be exposed to rock and glass and, and maybe even sand quite often, right? So that's the answer, uh, and that's why it's correct. And if you look at that pulmonary function, as you look at the volume, you can tell it's a restrictive lung disease, right? So once again, you know, a lot of students will, will you know, look at something in, in first aid or somewhere else and they'll see, oh yeah, you know, eggshell calcifications or, or you know, our rods or, or, or whatever that may be. But remember to know how the eggshell calcification looks because they may not give you that exact term. They may describe it instead. And a lot of students, when they describe it, instead of giving you that buzzword, end up getting it wrong. And so, you know, just, just don't fall for that trap, okay? 
So whenever you see a description of an image or, uh, or something on a Petri dish or a lab study, you know, don't immediately, you know, uh, start freaking out. Think about that description and what it's describing. And maybe that'll link you back to one of the buzzwords in your memory that you learned in the past. Okay. Uh, so uh, let, let's see what the other answer choices are incorrect. So we've got answer choice uh, D here, coal workers, uh, pneumoconiosis. Well, uh, we don't have a coal worker here, so that, that, I'm glad that, you know, not many people picked that one. Uh, C, COPD. Well, you know, that would happen uh, with students, with, with, with patients that have uh, uh, COPD, uh, uh, and it would show nodule infiltrates, and it's, you know, it's, it's associated with smoking. Uh, and it, Sorry, it would not show uh, these nodular infiltrates that we have, right? But the fact that we do have them, you know, that's going to rule this one out. Uh, um, asbestosis. You know, th that typically is going to affect the lower lobes of the lungs uh, and, and borreliosis. And, and that's going to happen generally in patients uh, who have a history of working in manufacturing uh, or aerospace, right? And there you'll see what we call a, a hilar lymph adenopathy. And, and, and it is a restrictive disease, and, and it's, it, it's, pretty, it, it's, it's pretty rare. Um, but, you know, once again, the, the, the demographic information here, the smoking combined with the the fact that he's a construction worker and the restrictive lung disease uh, should start pointing you to silicosis. And uh, if that didn't do it, then definitely a description of these calcifications should uh, help uh, get it uh, uh, get you to the right answer. So no, definitely some tough questions tonight, uh, but we're going to go ahead and uh, show you um, uh, something that will likely help you on test day. So. Uh, Jeff, if you want to pull up that uh, that that uh, link I sent you, if you don't mind. Yep, give me one second here. And while Jeff's pulling those up, these are the question IDs for the three questions we did this evening. So feel free to take a picture, write it down, uh, and you can simply go into US Assembly RX, type it into the RX search field, and I'll pull that question right up for you so that you can, um, you know, uh, review these in more detail on your own time. So what we're going to show you now is is you know. A, you know, have you ever like, you know, done questions or, or, or been flipping through a book, you know, like, okay, I kind of understand it, but I wish I could just go deeper. I wish I could do practice questions directly on this topic or go directly to first aid, right? So you can do that here with Rx bricks. And if you look at bricks here, every brick, and here it is, pneumoconiosis, right? Um, you're going to uh, see here your, your uh, learning objective. So after completing this brick, you'll be able to do the following, right? You have five things listed here. And then you have a nice little uh, case connection here. And as you can see, Jeff highlighting here, uh, pneumoconiosis, silicosis, the topic of the question today. So here's the case connection, right? So it's a kind of real life situation that we're going to introduce here, then tie it back in at the end. So, um, you know, you've got the case connection there, and you're going to go down here and look at, you know, uh, 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 what are pneumoconiosis? And so it gives you a nice explanation of what it is. And you have a little flashcard here that asks you, hey, what is the brief definition of it? And you can click that, and Jeff, if we'll click that for us, it'll give us a nice little uh, quick you know, fact check there. And then ask, you know, what is the pathogenesis of it? And then it explains it to you, right? So as you keep going through this break, you're going to keep learning about these topics. Uh, and Jeff, if you will, just kind of scroll down a little bit more. So as you can see, you know, it's active learning. It's in a very, you know, casual, conversational tone, not a formal textbook like, you know, you, you see elsewhere. So, you know, as you see here now, we've got asbestosis, which was one of the incorrect answers here, right? So all, all those answers should be here in this one break. Uh, and as we keep scrolling down here, uh, we're going to get to the treatment of it and back to that case connection, like I said, right? So we've gone, we had a case connection at the beginning. Now we're going to go back to it at the end now that we've covered the material. And just for good measure, we're going to scroll down a little bit more and give you a summary of all the key takeaway points from this one brick. And then just to make sure that you understand it, we're going to ask you questions. And these aren't necessarily bore style questions. They're just, just, just to test your knowledge, uh, you know, to make sure that you've taken away these points from the brick. And now you're going to scroll down. Keep going down. You're going to say, okay, now I get it. But you know what? Maybe I want to look into a little bit more. Or you know what? I think I got it down. Let me go practice and do some USMLE style questions now to make sure I've got it. Or let me go into first aid and see what it says. Or let me go into an express video and learn more about it in a video. And you can do all of that by simply going down to the go deeper section, which will then let you go to whichever one of those resources you want to go into. And as you can see here, when you type in first aid, boom, it takes you right to that page talking about the different pneumoconiosis. And there you go there, asbestos-related disease, borreliosis, co-worker pneumoconiosis, silicosis, all right there, right? So you can read it in the brick and then go find it in first aid. 
you can also go directly, like I said, into the question bank and do practice questions. You can go uh, watch a video if you want. And so instead of flipping through all of these different resources, right, you've got everything here in one thing and, and, and kind of just allows you to easily navigate without wasting time. And when you have this as well organized as it is, you are allowed, to, you know, it, it enables you to learn in an organized way. And when you do that, you're more likely to retain that material. So, uh, you know, with that being said, I'll uh, hand it back over to Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Sean. This is, uh, you know, again, if you're if you're new to the BRICS, uh, you know, this is a great uh, tool for for first pass learning, but also second and third pass. Uh, you know, we, we we talk to a lot of students who, uh, you know, rely on the BRICS uh, and have relied on the BRICS, uh, you know, as they. Uh, you know, they go through dedicated or as they get closer to uh, test day, you know, again, just, uh, you know, when you need a, you know, a refresher on a topic that maybe you uh, either, you know, you've, you've forgotten a little bit about or you didn't quite understand, uh, you know, well the first time, that's what, um, that's what it's here for. One of the other nice things is that as you're going through the brick, um, you can see these uh, that that some of these sections have these uh, little light uh, dotted underscores. And you know when you uh, roll over that, you can actually get a quick definition uh, as well as links to uh, you know other bricks that uh, that that cover that. Uh, or in some cases, uh, you can get to the first aid page. Uh, so pulmonary fibrosis, if you wanted to get a refresher on that, or if you're wondering, well, how is this covered in first aid? Um, you can, uh, you can go straight from here. So, uh, the, you know, the advantages here are really, uh, you know, it's the, the integrated approach, um, and, you know, being able to, uh, you know, find the information that you need at the point of challenge, uh, and, and, and ensure that you are covering, um, and reinforcing you know, the knowledge that you're going to need to be able to draw on, on test day. So, uh, you know, again, uh, we, we certainly invite you if you, you know, haven't checked out the exchange. Um, we, we, we think this is a, you know, a great tool. And one of the, one of the things that, that, that you're going to be learning about, in fact, we're going to make the announcement tomorrow is that, um, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about bricks. Um, we actually have an authoring tool that allows um, uh, educators to build their own bricks. And we're actually going to be opening that up to students um, starting tomorrow. So, uh, you know, again, you can uh, basically build your own bricks, build some of your own study materials, uh, and, and, and again, make those shareable to your friends and classmates and, and really any, you know, uh, students around the world. So uh, we're, uh, we're, we're very excited uh, about sharing this, uh, the, the, this new tool, uh, tomorrow.